Good afternoon and welcome back to the Gomer's YouTube channel where as you know we like to bring you new and exciting things that are happening in the store as far as products and, uh, and guests that, that come into town from time to time and today we have uh, Randy Woodridge from Krug Winery out of California. Hello Pat. Welcome. Thank you. You just got Happy in. to be here. Uh, glad you are here. You just flew in from Dallas. From Dallas, yes. I always love coming to Kansas City. I'm a Midwesterner so I like being back. Yeah, very cool. Well we, we did improve the weather for you today yeah, versus what it was <laughs> last week. So Great, thank yeah. you. Yep, yeah, you are very, very welcome. Much. Yeah, so Krug, you've been in uh, in this tasting room, or what used to be our tasting event room, um, three times anyway that I can yeah. remember. Yeah, we've been we've been here. We've done this in Flat Top Hills, which mm -hmm. is another one of our brands. So uh, obviously, it's been a few years now. So I'm happy to be back. Yeah, yeah, glad to have you. Glad Thank to have you. you. So what uh, what did you bring today? All right, well, we brought the the current vintages, uh, uh, all of our top selling wines from Charles Krug, and uh, so we're going to taste through these and give you a little history about the winery uh, and uh, talk a little bit about some of the details about the wines and then obviously you'll have the opportunity at some point to come in and, and purchase them here or uh, even maybe try them out. So um, we've already got the Sauvignon Blanc in the glass so yeah. I'd like to say thank you and cheers. Yeah, cheers. Uh, we're happy to be here. Charles Krug is actually the oldest winery in Napa. Founded by Charles Krug in 1861. Prussian immigrant that came over. He was not in the wine business, um, but through a, a variety of opportunities, including a dowry um, of about 550 acres when he was married, he was given the, this acreage just north of St. Helena in the Napa Valley. And at that time, he decided to start Charles Krug Winery. And uh, it, was, it was very important at the time, number one, the first winery in Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. It was really kind of the second winery in Northern California uh, uh, of this, um, Caliber, uh, Augustin Harasti uh, actually opened the first one in Carneros in Sonoma, and where Charles Krug actually uh, learned some of his winemaking practices and efforts from them and then opened up his own winery. Uh, also during that time period, he was uh, very innovative in some of the things that he did, including um, you taking a cider press and saying, why can't we use that mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to process and press the, the grapes and do the same thing. So that's really where the, um, the press came into to account and now they're all automated and um, they, they take care of the grapes and everything like that. But we actually have that press at the winery, uh, the original press that he used to innovate. Yeah. And also, for those that go out to Napa a lot, you're very used, or Sonoma, you're used to uh, uh, going to tasting rooms. Well, we had the first tasting room back in the 1870s. It was mm -hmm. the very first tasting room to be opened in Napa Valley. So uh, a long, long storied history uh, in regards to this winery. It did close down for a while during uh, Prohibition, but only closed down. It didn't go out of business or anything like that. They just stopped producing. Uh, they kept the winery license and everything like that. Yeah. Um, and then in 1943, it was really is where the next era started, and that was with the, the, Manda, the Mandavi family purchased it, Cesare and Rosa Mandavi, mm -hmm. uh, who those names aren't really well known, but their sons are, which are Peter and Robert Mandavi. And that's really where uh, the Mandavi legacy started, um, was at Charles Krug. Every, every Mandavi that came into the wine business went through Charles Krug, so to speak. Yep. So uh, for a quick pause here, uh, we poured the Napa Sauvignon Blanc into the glass here. This is a 2021 vintage. Uh, and uh, it's, it's become our second most popular selling wine that we make at Charles Krug next to the Napa Cabernet. Uh, stylistically, uh, it's, um, uh, it's beautifully balanced. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc, 100% stainless steel. Um, when Peter Sr., Robert's brother, first decided to get into the Sauvignon Blanc business, uh, he looked at New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, which were just starting to come into the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were, they were doing something different called the reductive um, winemaking practice. And that's basically where you shut down any extra oxygen to the fermentation process and it helps keep uh, helps oxidation out helps keep the brightness of the fruit and everything and also helps with the style of the wine so you know with this one Pat I don't know what you get out of it but um, you know it's it's got some citrus mm -hmm. it's not too tropical or anything but really good balance good acidity good I think balance. it's a really good food wine a really mm -hmm. good patio wine especially yep. at this time of year yeah it's a uh it's very crisp. It, um, what I like about it is it's not like a lot of domestic Sauvignon Blancs that want to be 
that fruit all the way through. Mm -hmm. The fruit is there, and then about 80% through the palate, it kind of tapers off and it finishes dry, mm -hmm. which, which personally is the style of sauvignon blanc that I like. And mm -hmm. I think when, with food, as you mentioned, is is a lot easier to pair with food than something that's kind of kind of wet or a fruit bomb all the way through. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, and without any uh, like semillon or anything like that, mm -hmm. where you get some of that ending fruit, you know, that I think that really just gives us a very good character, very classic, Mm -hmm. feel to this yep no this is delicious this this is fantastic this is one to with the weather we're gonna have to this afternoon mm -hmm. you know mid 70s here in Kansas City sit on the porch yeah. sit around the fire pit with something like this this is fantastic yeah and this one uh, this vintage the 2021 um, just got uh, from um, not Jeb Dunnick but uh, um, Suckling Suckling thank you just got yeah, a, got a 91 from him yeah. on this one so uh, get it while you can it's gonna be a hot one <laughs> Very good. How is production on this? Uh, we make about um, 30,000 cases. Okay. Uh, so it's pretty good. Um, as a winery in Napa, we're very small in total production. Mm -hmm. We have we make about 60, 65,000 cases total. Okay. Um, and that's very small when you think about some of the production of some of the, uh, the larger, very well-known brands and, and names out of there sure. that uh, have a lot more production. So we are not um, uh, a high production, you know, we keep it small and keep focused on the quality. Yeah, very cool. Well, this, yeah. Is, this is delicious and a, and a great wine for us to start today yeah, off Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yep. And as I pour the Chardonnay, uh, this is the 2019 Chardonnay here. This is, um, also, these are all Napa Appalachian. Um, by the way, the Sauvignon Blanc comes from mainly our vineyards right at the winery, uh, which is just north of uh, St. Helena, as I mentioned, right across from the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, right. And this is the original property still. It's not the same 550 acres You've been sold off through the years, but this is still the original winery site been been uh, refurbished uh, Rededicated it's, it's beautiful, but yeah. um, uh, when the um, Mandavi family purchased uh, the winery in 43 They were one of the first ones to go to a varietally labeled wines Cabernet Chardonnay Merlot whatever they were making before mm -hmm. It was it was more generic Burgundy Chablis. You know they borrowed the names from France basically to do that. So they they started that. 1944 was the first year that they made Napa Cabernet and also uh, their their uh, flagship, which was a vintage selection Cabernet, which is the best of the best every year. Okay. And so um, they've been making that since 1944. Uh, and then they 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 created a couple other. C K Mandavi came in 1946. So you can see. A lot of history these aren't brand new yeah. um, labels that are just hitting the shelves or anything they've been around and they've been through um, war they've been through recessions sure. um, everything like yeah. that so a lot of history and a lot of a lot of innovation uh -huh. kind of started at this property yeah either with Charles Krugel or with the Mondavis that and we'll talk about some of those here in a little bit when we get to the, to the reds but, yeah um, that it just kind of carried forward and, and everybody else in California everybody else. said hey that's a good idea. Let's start mm -hmm. doing that. It just kind of goes from there. So. And along with that, we've had a lot of very big names, um, um, like Behringer, that mm -hmm. have worked and worked at the at Charles Krug, and they've apprenticed there. So it's also been kind of a training ground for people to go on and start their own wineries or become famous winemakers sure. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So cool. yeah, very interesting there. Yeah. So they own five seven hundred fifty acres from Carneros up to Howell Mountain. Okay. Um, and this map is too, way too small to show the group, but uh, they, they're mainly in the Yountville area, St. Helena where I mentioned, um, but f down in Carneros, on the Napa side of Carneros, they have a nice sized uh, vineyard that they grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Okay. Pinot Noir, very, very small production, so um, we don't really get that one out too much, unfortunately, but the Chardonnay um, uh, comes across beautifully. Mm, uh, nice. Stacy Clark, our winemaker, uh, with all of her wines, she really likes to just bring out the, the natural qualities of each varietal. And so th that comes through with the Chardonnay. And, um, you know, there, there's um, an opportunity, I'd say, in Napa to um, make a bigger Chardonnay, you know, more butter, more mm -hmm. oak, you know, more malolactic oh, yeah, or whatever. Mal Malo, yes. And so Stacy goes the other direction because Carneros is so cool compared to the Napa Valley floor and further north. And, that and the, the soils are totally different, more marine soil, sandy and stuff like that, that it creates a profile that's just beautiful, beautiful uh, honeyed 
melony kind of, of flavor to it that she didn't want to overdo with oak. So like this is only 33% oak. The rest is stainless steel fermented. Right. And then it's blended together at the end to create what you get in the glass here. So nice. I'm gonna try it real quick here. Yeah, this is. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah. Just, just a touch of that, of that toasty oak kind of, mm -hmm. kind of midway through the palate there. Just yeah. very nice. Other than that, just the, the typical great Chardonnay, some apple, a little bit of a rounded melon, a little touch of honey in there. Mm -hmm. just, oh, just I'm really getting great. like Dover Sole or you know Sole Marnier or something like that to go. Mm -hmm. This is this just begs oh, sure. for kind of seafood kind of a scenario. Yeah, no, this yeah. is great. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of wine dinners with uh, the we, these wines, and people before we try the Chardonnay uh, are saying, "Well, I drink Sauv Blanc or I drink this." Mm -hmm. At the end of the dinners, they're coming up saying, "That's the best <laughs> Chardonnay I've had in a long time." So that's just kind of, that's to me, that's that's the proof in the pudding, is rather than me telling people, mm -hmm. people coming up and telling me. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. This is a great, great Chardonnay. Um, mm. Man, this is... Hard to hard to put down. This is hard to want to put down, exactly. Mm. Well, we're gonna go to the 2019 Napa Merlot next. Okay. Now, uh, we, we're talking about um, the family being there. Um, Robert and Peter were the mm -hmm. brothers and uh, Cesare and Rosa, and um, very different personalities, uh, both um, with their parents. You know, eventually, we're in our fourth generation of Mandavis right now. They were, Peter and Robert were the second generation. Right. And so they were into ownership early. So Robert was part owner of Charles Krug with Peter, um, but uh, Peter was very authoritarian in the sense of this is how you make wine, very black and white. Robert was a little more experimental mm -hmm. and more uh, on the uh, marketing looking, uh, you know, further out kind of a thing. Okay. And so, uh, you know, that did create some issues and stuff, but they still, for many years, a couple decades, worked together and created some fantastic wines and, and worked to be innovative, as you mentioned there a little bit ago, um, in regards to um, their winemaking practices like cold fermentation mm -hmm. and everything like that, which was not heard of. No. And so they started doing that and that just helps uh, manage the fermentation process better. So once again, you can get the qualities out without manipulating anything or, or additives or anything like that. You just are able to manage the fermentation process to get the fruit qualities that you want out of a certain varietal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's another innovation that they had coming out of there. Um, during the time that the Mandavis have owned, um, and with Peter Sr. leading the group, um, they purchased the, the acreage that I mentioned earlier, about 750 acres, but that was really done, and he, they were done with that by the 19, early 1990s. Okay. They had purchased over the years, and most of the vineyards, most of the land they had purchased was um, uh, either fallow with no vines on it, or orchard, or ranch land. Okay. So they were buying, um, uh, virgin land basically in planting their vineyards and uh, Peter senior said he quit buying he said when it got too expensive about eight thousand dollars an acre which in today's world would be about eight thousand dollars a square foot or so so Ooh. they got in <laughs> they got in Man. they're they're obviously they're uh, they're they're have a lot of valuable land out there yes um, but they keep most of it for themselves and so that's that's the great thing uh, the Merlot and the Cabernet come from the vineyards in Yountville Okay. Um, majority of them are on the uh, western side of Highway 29, goes north and south, okay. and goes up into the, the foothills of the Mayacamas Mountains. So you have some different minor elevation changes, but more than anything, you have different soil changes. Yeah. And so they know what each different block, um, what the outcome is going to be on certain vineyards or certain uh, vintages, what depending on, on the climate and how much rain or whatever they get. So they're able to, they know they have their Merlot planted where they want, they have their Cabernet planted where they want. So let me taste, take a taste of here real quick. Now this Merlot um, has, is known as mm. a cab drinker's Merlot. It's got oh, a yeah. lot of body, a lot of um, mouthfeel. Um, uh, it's got a lot of Cabernet characteristics. Now, Stacy mm -hmm. Clark, the winemaker, as I mentioned earlier, um, she blends her red wines. There's the the the, um, the Cabernets, the Napa Cabernet is never 100% Cabernet. Mm -hmm. The Merlots, not 100% Merlot. She'll use the best blending grapes that come vintage by vintage. 
Um, obviously with the Merlot, there is some Cab in there. In the Cab, there's some Merlot, but otherwise you might do some Petit Verdot, uh, some Carmenere or whatever, or Cabernet Franc. Uh, there's no recipe to it. Gotcha. So it kind of changes year in and year out. And the percentages change, again, depending on um, uh, how the grapes come out at, after harvest and everything. So when you're looking at the Merlot here, you're, you know, you're really looking at about 85% Merlot and then a, a splash of you know 8% Cabernet or so and then some Petit Verdot finishing it off. Yeah, well, this is very nice. And you mentioned, mentioned Stacy, for those who are not, who are not, who are not familiar with her, she went, and I didn't know this till, till earlier today when I was kind of buttoning up my notes for this, but I didn't realize she went to UC Davis. While she was at UC Davis, she interned with Stagsley. Mm -hmm graduated, went to um, Pine Ridge, and was kind of the, the lab tech, so to speak, mm -hmm. person of, um, what's that word, um, in, enologist? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. she mm -hmm. was the enologist, and mm -hmm. then and worked her way up, and she was the winemaker, uh -huh. until she left, and then came through again. And she was there quite <laughs> was a there while. A long so, time. Um, so they must have, um, the, the, the Madavis must have had some, some draw for her to come in, and, you know, from an iconic winery, you know, that's kind of a good thing too. Pine Ridge is also, and they've also always made very, very good mm -hmm. wines, but uh, she's been with us now over 11 years. Yeah. So very steady, uh, and very steady hand, and her signature uh, in the wines, along with um, Peter Jr. and Mark Mondavi, mm -hmm. um, you know, all getting together, and, and I just, they help more with the, the the philosophy or the end, you know, this is, this is what we want our wines to portray, gotcha. rather than, getting into the weeds of percentages of this or that. They're just more like, we want these wines to, to come out like this, or we want them to reflect this kind of heritage. Gotcha. So, um, and then on the, when I mentioned the fourth generation earlier, Angelina Mandavi, uh, who is a consulting winemaker for the company, uh, she also has some of her own very high-end um, wine uh, brands from Howl Mountain with her sisters. Okay. Um, she is the only uh, winemaker certified trained and she, at the University of Adelaide in Australia, she's the winemaker in the fourth generation. So okay. she's very involved too and helps out, um, not necessarily as much with Stacy, but with some of our other brands like Flat Top Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, this is fantastic. This is, um, yeah, as you mentioned, this is definitely a cab drinker's Merlot. Mm -hmm. This is not the typical Merlot by, by, any, by any description or stretch. Right. It's got to me. It's got the more Merlot fruit I think that mm -hmm. people want, but it's 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 enhanced. It's, yeah. it's deeper. It's richer, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Um, or it's so it's it's not as uh, as a dry, um, dark Cabernet fruit that you get out of it. But the Merlot still is there. But then it's backed up by a, a light tannins um, and a little bit of oak that comes along. So no, this this is delicious. This is delicious. This is another one that, that with most of the wines are getting great scores. This just got 93 from Jane Suckling as well. Uh -huh. So, you know, Suckling must like the wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's fantastic. And you know they try a lot. Uh -huh. so. They do. They okay, do. Okay, so this is our Napa Cabernet. This is the 2018 vintage. Okay. Oh, look at that color. That's lovely. And again, this we're down mainly in Yountville on this one. Um, that's again the, just a sheer a number of acres that they have of vineyards down there but that's just their cab in Merlot that's prime beautiful um, uh, little growing region for that for for those varietals and right. our land is just perfectly positioned for that and this is our best seller you find this in a lot of restaurants uh, you find it a lot of great places like Gomer's mm -hmm. um, uh, and you and that's about the most of it you can find it a little bit at more larger places but mm -hmm. again we don't make enough to be everywhere so right. um, you know we like to partner and uh, and have the, these available here yeah. that, that kind of scenario mm. so you get a different you know when I think about going back and trying uh, going for the aroma on the Merlot and mm -hmm. the cab this one's uh, a, a year different in vintage mm -hmm. a year older but it's it's the fruits more focused and it's it's definitely darker more yes. the uh, the dark um, not dark cherry even I think that might be a little too bright for it but you know dark uh, maybe cranberry or cassis or something mm -hmm. along that line yeah no, I'm getting I'm getting maybe a little bit of maybe a little plum but but definitely those those darker fruits that just that just really just pops mm -hmm. this is just really delicious. Yeah, and you can tell the Cabernet, you, you have some good tannin in this one still. Mm 
Uh, it tastes like a, a bigger wine. Yeah, it's a it's, it's definitely a big cab, but it it's soft. It's it's elegant. Mm -hmm. it, um, oh, this is this is fantastic. Yeah. Elegant, I think, is a really good word yeah. for this at great, this price point too. Yeah, great with food. Well, you know, obviously, like a lot of cabernets are, but this would just be a cab. You just kind of, again, an, an evening like we're going to have in Kansas City tonight. Just mm -hmm. pop it open on the porch. It's not going to be that that warm this evening. You could definitely pop something like this and, mm -hmm. and sit there and enjoy it with friends. And I actually tested this out last night at home, and uh, I can tell you that as you go through the bottle, it opens up very oh, nicely wow. too. Nice. So, uh, in fact, we by the time we emptied the bottle, we were hoping for some more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just it gets to that point where it's like, wow, that was really hitting all the notes. Nice. Now, like like with the Merlot, you said Stacy kind of uses Merlot predominantly mm -hmm. in the Merlot and the mm -hmm. backs up, you know, yep. eight percent cab and you know Cabernet Verdot and whatever. Similar, similar. Similar. She's got with five here. five varietals in five, this one. Okay. Eighty nine percent Cabernet, so that's the majority of it. And then she's got Petit Verdot. She uses Malbec in this one a little bit. Oh wow. Uh, Cabernet Franc and Merlot. Okay. So um, got a five blend there, and you know you got two percent of some, three percent of another. So if you had eighty nine, you only have eleven percent to play with mm -hmm. uh, in the balance. So. Um, and I think that comes out in here. I think you get a little bit of the Malbec. Yeah. Um, you, you got some of the Syrah, Petit Syrah on here. I, I mm -hmm. got that more, but I get the Malbec in this one more than the not. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that, definitely. Mm. This is very good. Very good. All right, we'll finish with, with um, one of our reserve wines. That's just a, a huge hit. This is the 2017 uh, Generations. And uh, this is a this is a fun story. This generations, obviously, because we're a multi generation company, family owned, to this date still. Um, but uh, it was it was kind of a for a while it was kind of a um, happy tumultuous mistake by Mark Mandavi. Okay. Uh, the first vintage they ever made was 1991, and Mark Mandavi was in charge of winery operations at the time. Peter Sr. was out more in uh, traveling and promoting the winery okay. nationally, and uh, then Peter Jr. Uh, was doing some more local marketing. So Peter Sr., dad, was at, was gone traveling, and uh, um, a winery, the, the Duckhorns actually, called up and said, Mark, I've got X amount of gallons, or not gallons, because it was not crushed yet, okay. of, of Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. I have no room for it. This obviously at the harvest. I have no room for it. Do you want it? About $30,000 value. Mark's like, yeah, okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. Not really looking, assessing his situation either. Sure. Well, he got the grapes over and started looking around and realized he didn't have any uh, extra capacity either, any uh -huh. extra tanks. Um, so he had some very good uh, vintage selection level Cabernet coming in um, and also some very good Merlot coming in. And so he said, I'm going to put them into one tank and I'm going to co-ferment them, which is not necessarily done that much anymore because right. it's very risky. You can yes. lose the whole batch mm -hmm. because you got different, different fermentation yes. um, uh, time frames and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But he put them into one tank and he, he went, he went we're co-fermenting, we're doing it. <laughs> and he wrote BDX on the outside of the, um, uh, the vat. Okay. And uh, dad came home, Peter Sr. came home, was doing his morning walkthroughs of the, of the cellar and asked, you know, what is this? And uh, so Mark had to kind of fess up. Kind of explain. And it didn't go over well. Uh, it was, uh, he didn't get kicked out of the family, but he was um, not on the, um, the nice list for a while. So dad did everything he could to think, how can we get our money back on this? Mm -hmm. And so they said, we're gonna ferment it through, we're gonna treat it as best we can through the process and, um, and continue just to, to monitor it. And then at the end, let's hope we can sell it off. Sure. And so they did that, they, they, they fermented it, they fermented it in barrels, they let it age in barrels, then they bottled it. They bottled it in, in um, bottles without labels, without anything on them, just so they, they were generic so somebody else could slap their, their, their winery label on it or something like that. And in 1994, so three years, um, they've been holding and going through the process, they, um, they said, all right, let's try it, kind of like the last test. Uh -huh. And Peter Sr. Um, was like, we have a winner. We have a brand new reserve wine from Charles Krug. Wow. Now we just have to figure out what to call it. Yeah. And uh, a seller hand 
um, came by that's been there for a long time and says, why don't you call it Generations because you're a multi-generation family owned and you want to continue that way. So they did. So they named it Generations. Huh. And so the first vintage was 91, not released until 94. And so it's one of the um, younger wines in a sense, not younger as far as just bottled, but younger as far as development being put in on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so the difference on this one now, if after that long story, is that um, where the others are, you know, focus on being varietally correct at the final with some blending. This one is a Bordeaux mentality. Mm -hmm. Now, not, they're all Bordeaux varietals, right? But this is, Stacy goes into it thinking, how do I make this one wine so you don't worry about if it's a Cab, a Merlot, or whatever. You just try it, and you're like, wow, that's a really good red wine. Yeah. And so, you know, she doesn't use a ton of oak um, on all of these, but mm -hmm. this one, not a ton of oak as far as time goes. It's all 100% French new but she's only around 20 months or so in oak, where a lot of these other wineries might be 24 to 36 months. Yes. So she, she manages the oak, she manages, manages the extraction, so all she get is just a beautiful, balanced, um, you got fruit, you've got tannin, you've got structure, everything is just all in synchrony, mm -hmm. syn synchronized together. Yeah, no, this is, this is delicious. It's just a great way to finish up. Oh it's a beautiful gosh. wine. Very small production, mm -hmm. um, but it is available. It's our entry level, and then we go up, and so the, the, the amount that we make kind of decreases on each one. Yep. So this is our most available reserve. That's why we like to get it out and taste it with people, um, because uh, they can find it. Or um, like you here, you could special order it if somebody was looking for that kind of thing, mm -hmm. if you didn't already have it on your shelf. Right. No, this is delicious. This is bright, juicy, darker fruits, full tannin, full bodied. And I wouldn't say full tannin, I'd say probably medium medium to full tannin. Yeah. And and just full bodied. This is this is fantastic wine. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And it was just open recently, so again this will be like the Cabernet I was talking about last night. This one this one opens up beautifully. It doesn't need to be decanted. I don't think it's to that level of a reserve wine where mm -hmm. um, it has to aerate it, it definitely benefits, but it doesn't have to be. It's, it doesn't throw sediment or anything like that. Um, uh, it's, it's just, it is accessible now. It's going to be accessible in an hour, two hours, three hours. It's just going to be beautiful. Yeah, this is, this is, I can just see this opening up over a period of, of a few hours and just mm -hmm. being even more beautiful than it is now. This is fantastic. And to give you mm -hmm. just one more quick hint or note on that, um, I, talk, I was talking that she doesn't make 100% uh, varietals. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one in the 15 vintage was actually 99% Cabernet, 1% Petit Verdot. Okay. This one is 83% Cabernet, and then she builds up Petit Verdot and Merlot behind it. So she gets close sometimes, um, but uh, in general, so that gives you the idea. And if you look at the label, it just doesn't say anything. It doesn't say a variety. It just says Generations Napa Valley. Oh, yeah. So it's wide open to what they can put, what they want to put in here. There's no restrictions to a cab or even a red wine or red blend. It's just generations. So uh, it's a great um, I, I, it's a it's a great image. It, it creates a great image for the iconic status of Charles Creek Winery. I think. Mm -hmm. No, agreed. These are this is fantastic, and and all these wines, all five of these wines, plus other ones that, that we've tried here before, um, are just great representations of. The, the winemaking of, uh, of Mondavi's and, and crew before them is mm -hmm. fantastic. And mm -hmm. like I said, the, the fourth generation now is, can, is carrying that yeah that torch forward, so to they speak. Are. Yeah, they're um, basically the, the fourth generation uh, is is taking over ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, they're having to be tricky because all the state taxes. Sure. But then uh, also uh, we're being certified as a uh, uh, um, woman majority owned wine company or company. Okay. So um, they're going through those certifications too. And so the fourth generation is, uh, I think it's four daughters in total and one son. Okay. So <laughs> hopefully the one son gets to be on the board. Right. <laughs> Very cool. Are there any, knowing the, you know, the history uh, with, with all the innovations that they, that they have done through the years, is there anything that you can share that they're behind the scenes working on that you're aware of to kind of say, hey, we that is working. Let's be the first to that. Or not, No, I haven't heard okay. any of that recently. Um, okay. Uh, but over the last couple of years, things have been um, kind of just uh, 
put on hold because everybody just working through COVID. Sure. And so they're you know they're working to produce. And we had the fires in 2020. Mm -hmm. We did not. We got we got affected by some smoke taint, but that product, the, the those grapes never made it into any of our 2020 vintage. So our Good. production's down um, on 2020, mm -hmm. but we have enough 19 and 21 to bridge. So they over the last couple of years, as a lot of wineries, and we're lucky enough that we are still around. Um, they've just been focusing on. Uh, quality management and, and making sure that they can stay in business by you know selling them what they can locally and stuff too sure but, uh, there might be we're gonna for the first time we'll be out in Napa for meetings in July so it's been a while since we've been out there so maybe they're right. gonna surprise us I don't know very cool I'll let you know <laughs> okay yeah please do please do very cool anything else that, that no, you want to share with us and no um, I just you know these are fantastic wines uh, the Charles Krug name unless you know the history doesn't really resonate like mm -hmm. some other brands but when you think about the fact of the history of the winery and the fact that it's been around longer than anybody else in Napa yeah, long um, time. and the the name behind it the Mandavi name uh, I think that that makes it so it, it makes it worth exploring and trying out yeah no, fantastic wines thank you for uh, for coming up from Dallas today hey, appreciate you spending cheers. time with us thank you cheers. appreciate it